welcome to the study of the Sabbath School with the Ministerial Research Institute. We're so glad you've taken the time to study the lesson with us, and we want to wish you all a blessed Sabbath day. We're going to study lesson number 10 for today, June 3rd, 2023. The title is Jubal and Ungodly Music. I'm your host, Pastor Idel Suarez, and... We have our dear senior pastor, Larry Watts at Norman College, who's a specialist in this area of music. And we are delighted, Pastor Watts, that you can join us to help us study the lesson today. I'm really happy to be here and so glad you've joined us. May God give us a beautiful understanding of the importance and power of music today and how it can be used to God's glory. Could you lead us in prayer, please? Dear Father in heaven, by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we bow before your throne today as the angels praise your holy name in the courts above. Help us to praise your name here below. Help us to know what it means to have the angels join us in our songs and that the Holy Spirit can empower us through music to be a blessing to others and help us to avoid the pitfalls of self uh, exaltation in this gift that you have given us of music. We wake up and hear the, the sound of nature and all those things that sing, and we want to join with them and with your angels before your throne now and in the, in the eons to come in the world on, afar. So give us grace. We might practice here for those days there. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We have the first subtitle, Sources of Unholy Music. And if you look at the lesson, most of it is about unholy music. And then the last part is how to overcome unholy music and the sacred music that God wants us to participate in. What was the name of Jabel's brother? It was Jubal. And some people believe that they were twins because their names kind of like rhyme, and those that have twins like to give names that rhyme to twins. They may have been identical twins. They may have been fraternal twins. We don't know. It's just a possibility. So his name was Jubal, and Jubal means inventor, depending on who you read. And what was his proficiency? You know, what was his profession should be the question. That's how it was written in Spanish. And I wrote the original in Spanish. His, his profession was, he was a, uh, it says here, he's a father of all such as handle the harp and organ. Now, the Spanish translation doesn't say that. The Spanish translation says that he's the father of all those that play the flute. But here it says the harp and the organ. Did they have organs before the flood? I don't know. That's quite fascinating to think that they would have had a pump organ, maybe even an electric organ. Um, but the harp, you know, okay, a stringed instrument. And the second part of the question is, who else was supremely proficient in music and musical instruments? Pastor Watts, as you were praying, and you said that as we exercise our gift of music, whether it be in instruments or, or choral and singing, that we will not be led to exaltation, that we may not be led to pride. And I think about the devil, Lucifer, he was this great music director, the heavenly choir director. Maybe he said to himself, I am so talented. I can sing so beautifully. I can lead the choir so heavenly. I really need to exalt myself. That pride, pride and covetousness were, and selfishness were the root of evil in the universe. Uh, please comment, Pastor Watts. Yeah, I've always wondered about this organ business uh, in the King James Version. I think that when William Tyndale translated that, he probably didn't know what to translate it as. And maybe the Spanish 
as a better version to say a flute, you know, um, an instrument that is that the sound is made by the passing of air. And that's an organ of any kind. So a flute would uh, loosely define an organ as such. And then the the exaltation that Satan was so beautiful and so powerful and so perfect, which we're going to read in the in the next questions or so, that we have many talented people and how many uh, I just I just think of all the musicians that actually sold their souls so they could be famous, rich and famous, and many of them died before they were forty. Wow. It's 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 really. You, you pay a price when you sell your soul. Question two. What did the development of the impious music invented by Jubal contribute to? Tell us, Pastor Watts. What did this ungodly, worldly music lead to? As I was studying the lesson, I was thinking about uh, some presentations I've heard on music. And the lesson talks about the dance hall, the, the different places where music is sung. And, and if you look at the development of music over time, it's, it's really uh, progressive in its forms. And I've always said that music um, tells us where we've been. Art tells us where we're going. And so the music, uh, if you look at, the, and this is another thing about the Song of Moses, what did they sing? They sing after crossing the Red Sea, they sang the Song of Moses. Well, the Song of Moses is mentioned also in uh, Book of Revelation chapter 15, but it has nothing to do, it seems, to us, uh, to my way of thinking, human way of thinking, that has nothing to do with the Song of Moses. Nothing is mentioned there about crossing the Red Sea or anything like that, because the Song of Moses means those who sing according to their experience. And that is what we have in our songbook. For instance, when we sing our songbooks, we have a songbook before us. I'm, I have here a songbook, and before it is, I need thee every hour. When we sing that song, are we singing what, just the words? Or are we singing from our heart? If we're not singing from our heart, we're false singers. If we don't mean what we sing, and we're just singing to be a part of the choir and part of the congregation, we are not true to the music because the Song of Moses is a song of the experience. In the Psalm in Isaiah um, 15, isn't it doesn't sound like the words from Song of Moses because it's the Song of Moses in the sense that means that we're singing from the heart. And that's what the lesson's about when it speaks about this. So um, the Holy Flesh Movement is, is referenced here. And I think that was about 1857. And this was, um, I can't remember the city now, but these people were against, they were rejecting the spirit of prophecy. They were from Indianapolis. Indianapolis, that's right. They were rejecting the spirit of prophecy. And and the, the leaders in the cause at that time were kind of soft peddling the, the spirit of prophecy. And they decided that they shouldn't do that, that they should come out strong for the spirit of prophecy. And that is how um, they they realized that because they were trying to please people a little bit too much, that they needed to be stronger and forthright with presenting of the message. And so the, the those who were rejecting the light, what was happening to them? They were going to fanaticism. And part of that is always seen in music. They were dancing in church and yelling and screaming. And what what do we see in our world today? The, that kind of spirit has taken over the churches. So when we look at this impious music of Jubal's generation, Jubal in, invented these instruments, but I don't think he invented them to praise God. He was from the line of evil. And I believe that it contributed to the evil imagination to wickedness, to corruption, to violence. As I listen at some rap music today, I mean, some of it says commit suicide. Others say kill the cops. I mean, there's all these statements that are outright. It's no longer subliminal. We were talking with Elder Adina Hukum this week, and he says, you know, it used to be subliminal, but not anymore. Now it's outright and open. 
They'll, they'll say things that are terrible, even in regards to incest and, and, and abuse. And all this led to violence and sensuality to where the music becomes a carnival. And then the second part of the question is with, according to what Moses wrote, what are some characteristics of ungodly music? Now help me, Pastor Watts, you are a musician. And I understand that the beat has a lot to do with it. A one, three versus one, four. And this noise that Joshua heard, he thought it was a sign of war, the sound of war. And Moses says, no, it's not of war. It is of dancing. It is of ungodliness. It's a noise. It's a warlike beat that has an emphasis on the drum. That's what I see that's very common in worldly music, this emphasis on the on the drum and the instruments of percussion. Um, could you comment on this, please? Yeah, drums have been shown or in the spirit of prophecy to be a part of the last time deception. She's, she's association with that, drums. And so, you know, we sometimes allow people to use a recording in the church. And many of these recordings are very nice as they begin. They begin nice and sweet and soft and lovely. And then it gets more and more and more ruckus and more harder with the drums. And so it's very subtle what is happening, the way they do it, even within a song itself. But some people said... We can't have any kind of rhythm in the music. Well, music is made up of rhythm, pathos, liturgy, sound, harmony. Sometimes there's many um, cultures today that don't have harmony. They only sing a melody and it becomes very, very um, intricate. You know, they use quarter tones instead of half tones. And that's what you see in the East, the Indian music and Pakistan and those places. They don't have harmonious music and harmony didn't come in until about five six seven hundred years ago well everybody in in times of christ we believe saying unison so but i want to continue with this comment because you're asking about it and i think it's very important for us to understand that the rhythm itself is not sin but when it becomes like the whole pancake uh, becomes everything you know a little salt is okay. In fact, let every offering be seasoned with salt. And that's the same with music. It needs to have a movement. It needs to move forward. And she mentions waltzes, and that's a three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. That is a waltz. And then there's um, to there's some people who believe that if it's a six, eight, which is a variation of uh, three, four, which is one, two, three, one, two, three. If you do a six, eight song, you have to do it fast because six, eight is meant if they wanted it four, they would do it in three, four. But if they do it in six, eight, they have to do it fast. I think this is, this is a synthetic way of approaching music. The principle is it should be joyful. It should be uh, something you can sing without being pushed, 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 pushed. And so we need to have a song, not to be a, a funeral dirge, but it should be with rhythm. But like we said, it, it doesn't need to be solid music, a beat. It needs to be with a kind of pathos. with, um, And that means with sincere energy. And she mentions that here in other, in other places. So the... And there's another portion that people complain about, and that is the accent, the the dotted quarter note, which is dum da dum da dum da dum. That is also looked upon by some as being evil. I don't consider it as such, but it needs to be sung with the proper emphasis, not the dung, but da da di da di da di. It has to be done with understanding, with um compassion and with um, a sweetness to it. So it's, it's not only just the music itself, but how you approach it. I mean, it can be written in different ways and there can be certain accents. And this is very common today in, in music. And we need, just need to be really careful how we sing those songs. 
Thank you. We go to question three. What effects does unholy music have on the body, the mind, and the spirit? Well, let me say that music can make the body move. It can influence our emotions, make us happy, make us sad, make us angry, make us fearful. It excites the mind and it can kill. I tell you, this unholy music can kill the spiritual nature, the moral nature of humankind. And it can rapidly be associated with idolatry. It can rapidly be associated with sensuality. But unholy music prepares the body, the mind, and the spirit for unholy thought and unholy words and unholy action and an unholy character. And we have the example here in Daniel where they're playing all this music to worship the image, a golden image. And I learned, Brother Watts, is that in terms of the origin of um, rock, how it was preceded by rhythm and blues, and that was preceded by Caribbean music, and that was preceded from African music that the slaves brought over to the Caribbean. So from Africa to the Caribbean, the Caribbean to the states, uh, to the southern states, and then the development of rock and hard rock, and now we have rap and all this. And as I trace it all the way back to Africa, to many of the tribes there, I can say, as I've been to Africa, the heavy emphasis on the drum and the dancing. And this dancing was also a form of worship, worshiping false gods and heathenism and paganism that we have today in these rhythms of the past, of La Bamba, of the tango, and, and all of these other rhythms that evolved uh, from it. And unholy music leads to unholiness, whereas holy music leads to holiness. And on what special day every year in Israel was there no dancing? It was on the day of Yom Kippur. Would you like to add, Pastor Wallace? A couple of things, yes. I remember talking to one person, and he said, I love country music. But I noticed that when I listen to country music, you know, you lose your house, you lose your wife, you lose your dog. You, you know, you play it backwards, you get everything back, someone said. But uh, he said, I, when I, listen, I love country music, but when I listen to it, I lose my spirituality. I don't feel like w w of studying the Bible. I talked to another person who actually was working in nightclubs and he was controlling the music. And he actually said, I can get the people to do anything through music. I just little by little change the beat, change the sound, and pretty soon they're doing it on the floor. And so, yes, and when I was in Africa, you know, I, I went to Africa 30 years ago, actually November, what was it, 4th, 1994, I think it was. That's quite a long time ago. Um, I noticed the music there. You know, you have to ride in the buses and go places. And I'm surprised when I go to the big box stores today, what am I hearing? I'm hearing what I heard back then, 30 years ago in Africa. That's the kind of music they're playing on the radio and in stores today. And I think, and I think to myself, let me out of here. Get me out of here. I don't want to listen to this stuff. I think what the worst part of it is that this pagan music, unholy music, this warlike beat, this emphasis on the drum has penetrated and overwhelmed and conquered all Christian radio stations now. Just about all of them. There are very few that still play holy music. And that we can trace it back. Maybe, actually, we can trace it back to Egypt and also to Babylon. These are Babylonian rhythms that we need to say. No. Uh, Jesus said uh, the, that you should not um, have that thing that the heathen do, which is that often repeated, repeating, 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 repeating. 
repeating the words. And this become, puts people in a trance. And the object of this new age is to empty the mind, to, to reach nirvana. And how do they do that? By brainwashing the person through this uh, repetitive beating. And it puts the brain to sleep. And, you know, I've studied a little bit about sleep problems as well. And they say the, that when you have a rhythm, a simple rhythm of tapping your hands when you want to go to sleep, it works. And so your mind gets tired and you can go to sleep. And they're taking that to an extreme. And they're causing people to, to lose their unconscious mind, their conscious, their conscience. And through this repetition, and Jesus said, in in his first prayer, he said, don't do those kinds of vain repetition, because he knew that was a source of putting people's minds and consciences to sleep. Thank you for sharing that. I want to take, make a note of that. That's very profound, this vain repetition that puts the conscious, the consciousness to sleep. Question four. What happened as David and the entire house of Israel were playing music before the Ark of the Covenant on the first attempt to move it to Jerusalem? We have Uzzah. And what did he do, Pastor? You know, this is really a, a sad story. Um, here was Uzzah. He had the Ark in his house. And they were taking care of it. And they were all blessed for that. And he must have known that it was wrong to put his hand forth to do that. But he thought this was an exception. And what happens when we do exceptions of a certain nature? They cause death. And here, it's a lesson for us that, oh, it's a little music, it's not so much. It's like a lot in the city of, of um, after he was kicked out of, of, of Sodom, Sodom. And, and he wanted to go to this other little city, I forget the name of it, you probably remember. Zor. Zor, that's right. It's only a little city. And so here we have only a little music. Oh, just once in a while. I like this kind of music. And I, I gave a, song, uh, a lecture, uh, uh, you know, they were asking me about music and, and rap. And what did I tell them? I said, I like rap. I think it's really cool. But what it does, if you notice, there is no God in it. It's all self-exaltation. It's all me and all you. There's no God there. And it's a very interesting kind of repetition. There's a little clicking going on there that is kind of repetition, and it's monotonous. Uh, yeah, although the words are interesting, but it has nothing to do with praising God. It's all praise to men. And so because of the nature of it itself and what it's doing to you, you want to listen to that? I'm sorry for you. It may be cool, and I like it too as a human being, but I have to make a choice that I don't want to be a part of something that is satanic, and it is satanic. What was the sad result after Herod the Tetrarch and his officers were in trance by the impious music and sensual dance? We find here um, three things. We find the alcohol, we find the dancing, and we have music. She wasn't just dancing with no music. There was music. And these men were all trance. They were hypnotized. Unholy music puts us in a trance. This dancing is very sensual. It puts people in a trance. It, it really dim awakens unholy imaginations, unholy thoughts. And as with Uzzah, so with Herod, one a little, the other a lot, both led to death. They died. Pastor Watts. Yeah, David's dancing. People use that as an example, and that's in our lesson here. But the question asked also what you already answered it. We're in the Day of Atonement. You know, when we get to heaven, we're going to put on the jewels. We're going to put on the crown. We're going to have golden slippers. 
And we're going to have all kinds of things like that. And we're going to dance before the Lord, but it's going to be a holy dance. But today, in the Day of Atonement, we have a reason to be solemn, to be still, and know that God is the Lord. And so this business of movement of the body, uh, and if, if you're tapping your foot too much, mm, I don't know what, what to think there, because maybe that's just a little bit of a habit, but we need to have rhythm, but it has to be respectful. And as, as we work before the Lord and worship before him, there's uh, a need for being uh, rather careful in that. And so, you know, uh, Zephaniah chapter 317 says, Thy Lord thy God is in the midst of, of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love, or he will show you his love, and he will joy over thee with singing. I love that verse because it tells us that God is a singer. And we know that Jesus, when he was in Nazareth, his voice was raised in prayer and thanksgiving to God. And those who heard him walked the streets of Jerusalem, heard him singing. And it says in another place that Jesus, when he was on earth, saw scenes of contention and strife. He would raise his voice in notes of melodious songs, praising God. The presence of God would be felt in hearts of those who had been contending would be influenced by the Spirit as they joined the singing. So these are some thoughts about praise. And when tempted, Sister White says, sing. And when we have fear, sing. And when tempted to go into the dark cave of doubt, she says, sing. Arise, my soul. Arise, shake off thy guilty fears. Hymn number 413 in our hymnal. So pray, and I'd like to mention one more thing while we're talking about this. She says something very interesting about singing. She said, pray more than you sing. Mm -hmm. And so we're talking about singing here, and we should do more singing, but we should also do more praying. Amen. We have another question, and that's question number five. Sacred music and its blessing. Now we're going to do a shift, 180 degree. What type of music does God wants? Does God want his people to enjoy and sing? There's a spelling error there. What type of music does God want his people to enjoy and sing? And what health benefits does sacred music impart? Help well, well, you know, um, we know that uh, um, there is some health benefit to music. <laughs> this is a very important point that I, I'm glad you reminded me and asked me this question, because why do we sing in church? Do you know that when you sing, more of your brain is occupied in singing than in any other activity? When you put, when they put those electrodes on a brain and they're singing, more of the light of the brain lightens up in singing than any other activity. So when we sing, we're oxygenating our blood. If we sing properly from our diaphragm, we stand up straight. Stand, okay. That's why we stand when we sing, because it helps us. And if we're going to receive the message of God, we need to oxygenate our blood. And how's the best way to do that? And singing. And when you oxygenate your blood, what happens? You know, cancer grows because it's deprived of oxygen. It gets too much sugar and, and too little oxygen. And that's what causes many sicknesses. So if we're singing, we're helping our body. It's like medicine. You know, uh, what does it say? What's like medicine uh, uh, in the Bible? What does it say? A good a merry heart. And how, and when, yeah, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. And when you sing, I, I was once told, you can't be mad and sing. <laughs> and I think that's true. I remember I was singing in a place in, a, in, a, in junior college. I was in a place where I had to sing, and there was a very terrible thing that happened, and I had to sing. And I was angry because of what had happened. Things went wrong on the on the stage, and I had to now sing. And I was... <laughs> 
and I when I get through, got through singing, I wasn't mad anymore. And so <clears throat> singing is very powerful. And what is joy? Joy is healing. And if you want to have more joy in your life, sing. Amen. Following on this uh, second part, what health benefits the sacred music in part? It provides mental health. It is a healing agent for mental illness, as we see with Saul. Listening to sacred music uplifts the soul. Now let's talk about what type of music does God want his people to enjoy and sing? Sacred music. Music that's for worship. Worshiping him, not the devil. Music that repeats the lyrics of the psalms, hymns, melodies of worship that praise God. It is a music is a sense of prayer. It's a prayer to God where we open our mind. And uh, one of the great benefits of music in worship is that it prepares the heart and the mind for the word of God. I read used to preach if we don't have a special song or a congregational song immediately before the word of God is broken. I mean, it's I really children's stories, but you'll see that I always include a special song before the sermon. And I hope my fellow preachers will do the same because it prepares the heart and the mind for receiving the word of God. It uplifts us to Jesus. Yes. And, uh, that is a very important point, and we made it uh, clear that when you sing, you open your mind, and I think that we should really insist more than we do that the congregation sing before the preaching, not just a special. That's my personal opinion, because it oxygenates the mind and it prepares us to receive the word. Question six. What instrument did the priests of the order of Aaron play that will be played by the high priests of the order of Melchizedek? Well, the high priests of the order of Melchizedek is Jesus Christ. He is the king of Salem. He is the king of righteousness. Melchizedek, Melk means, or Melchi means my king. Sedek, righteousness. Salem means peace. So in Hebrews chapter 6, we find Christ presented as the high priest of the order of Melchizedek, not of Aaron, but of Melchizedek. And this priest plays the trumpet. He loves to play the shofar. And how should the voice and instruments be used in religious service? Pastor Watts mentioned that. You have to pray and sing and play with your understanding, with your heart. You it has you have to be meditating upon the words. You have to be meditating upon the Lord. You have to imagine as if you were in the presence of the Lord, oh God, the Lord our God. And I want to emphasize that singing and instruments have to be played with distinction, with skill. With the right sound, the right note, the right tempo, the right pathos, the right timing, because it has to be a reflection of our attitude toward our Creator, Pastor White. Yes, and uh, Sister White, we don't often think of this, but a symphony uh, is something that's been well composed. It's, it has its parts and. It has a repetition and so forth. And I, I think a good sermon is like a good piece of music. It has form. And of course, Jesus did too. There's a text in Selected Messages, Volume 3, page 333, um, point three, point of the question before, the text before says, everything that is connected in any way with religious worship should be dignified, solemn, and impressive. The very same may be said of singing. And so the, the quote goes on. I don't want to take too much time, but it does talk about uh, the fact that she didn't like operatic singing because it's 
done with a lot of force and it isn't done with passion. It's not noise that God wants. He wants it, the things to be harmonious and balanced. And our and our minds and our bodies, our spirit, soul, and body all need to, we have a harmonious, we have a holistic message. And I think that has to do with our preaching, with our singing, with our eating, with our way of life, that we need to be uh, careful in all those things to balance everything. We don't want too much salt in our food, and we don't want too much rhythm in our music. Thank you. The last question. Since sacred music is a blessing to calm restless spirits, there you have another health benefit. It calms our stress. It de-stresses us. What did Jesus do in Nazareth, Pastor? Was told us he used to sing there. When people came to his shop and they were in a hurry. They were trying to stress him out. He would start to sing psalms and so on. Everyone in the carpenter's shop was singing. Singing and music is contagious, really contagious. If you hear the right rhythm, you will want to sing also. You'll want to participate in the singing. Now, since sacred music is a blessing to calm restless spirits, what did Jesus do in Nazareth and also just before the coming danger of his arrest? Scripture says that they sung a hymn altogether. Or they had this male choir, and I believe they sang many times. I believe as Jesus when about his crusades, the apostles would all come together, like my African brethren do at, at conferences. They all come together, this great male choir, and they sing. There's such harmony. There's such rhythm. There's, there's such pathos in the music that you're uplifted. I'm talking about religious, sacred music, and Jesus participated in that. And so did the apostles, and so have God's people. I mean, Luther was a songwriter. Wesley was a songwriter. These great men of God that were great preachers were also songwriters and singers. And it says, with whom will the saved sing? Tell us, Pastor, who are we going to sing? With? There's a statement. I don't know where it is. I've looked for it several times, but it says, when... Um, the music is of uh, unholy nature, the angels sing. And there's another statement that says, when we sing in harmony, in unison, uh, in a, with a, a, you know, well done, the angels actually join us in our singing. And so we can have the angels join us here that we might soon join them there. And you mentioned Charles Wesley, the song that I just quoted, Arise, My Soul, Arise, Shake Off Thy Guilty Fears, was written by Charles Wesley. And so he was a songwriter. And I'm always happy about my name, Watts, because Isaac Watts was one of the greatest songwriters and hymnalists in the history of the Christian church. He, he didn't have any children, but I am the son of one of his uncles, one of his brothers. So... Uh, he was my uncle. And so, and I, and my mother's name was Newton. You know, uh, Isaac Newton wrote, uh, John Newton rather wrote uh, uh, Amazing Grace. We haven't traced our family back to him, but we'd like to. But anyway, we can be associated with the angels. And in uh, Zechariah chapter three, it says, if we will go the way of the Lord, God will give us a place to walk with those that stand by. And I believe we can also say sing with those that stand by, and that's the angels. And we want the angels to join us here as we as much want to join them there. Won't that be wonderful when we get to sing with the angel choirs? But it's wonderful now when we do our best to sing praises to God here because the angels will join us. And so the beauty of heaven can be felt on earth. And like you said, sometimes there's more power in the singing in the song, in the specials, than in the sermon. Yes, we will sing with the angels. The redeemed will sing with the angels. And with Jesus. Jesus is going to sing. I believe he's going to have this remarkable soul. And God, you quoted from the Old Testament, that God sings. He rejoices. And 
I picture it like a wedding where the bridegroom sings uh, or the bride sings and the choir sings. It will be a great time of rejoicing. And as you mentioned, Pastor, if we want to sing with God in heaven and with the angels, we must start singing with them here. If we participate either in listening to or playing unholy music, it will cause the angels to weep. But if we play holy music, it will cause them to sing. Let us pray. Father, we come to you and we thank you for your love and your mercy. And help us to be singers and musicians of sacred music, of holy music that worships you, that refreshes the soul and prepares us to stand when Christ shall return. Bless those that study the lesson. Be with this program. Bless our dear Pastor Watts and his ministry. And we pray for your lead. Forgive us our sins and help us to change for the better. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Watts, uh, do you have any final word before we say goodbye? One thing I didn't mention is Paul and Silas. Where did they sing? And so no matter where we are, we can sing to the glory of God. No matter what we're going through, let's praise God and remember to pray even as much or more than we sing. Amen. Amen. We want to thank Pastor Watts and also Brother Gary Ahukum and Elder Adina Ahukum. And we want to congratulate our dear elder Adina Hukum for being elected president of one of the fields in the American Union, Puerto Rican field. May the Lord fill him with his spirit of grace. And may he soon join the ministry of pastors. And thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next week, Lord willing. Have a blessed Sabbath.